All right, sounds good. So it is Communion Sunday. If you didn't grab your communion cup later on when Pastor Ken does communion, just wave at us and we'll make sure it comes in for you. All right, and let's call up Pastor Ken if you want to start the service, please. Just while you're waiting. So some of you might be wondering where the countdown music was or that little video. We're having a little bit of... We're nobody's having a little wondering. Bit of tech issues, so that's all. No, 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 no. Nobody's wondering. It was fine. I was wondering. That's okay. <laughs> Nobody was wondering. I promise. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I wonder if we should send up a, some sort of foghorn message to everybody. Services started. Uh, this is. Last week when we came in and I said we could uh, roll a bowling ball down, uh, you know, or blast a cannon, and we, we wouldn't hit anybody. And it's kind of like the same this morning, but I don't know. But last week we filled up pretty quick, so I'm looking for the same thing uh, this morning. We have the awesome privilege of having Luke with us again. I was going to try your last name, Luke, but I got it wrong last time. I'll just... We won't even make a deal of it. I got to tell you, you guys, I I don't know Luke really well, but any kind of connection we've had, I just absolutely love your spirit, Luke. And I feel like we, you know, you're made for us for this this season we're in. And I, when uh, Jenny told me that you were on deck for this week, when I told Linda that, we were both really delighted over it. So it's, it's really good to have you. Welcome this morning. Love you, bud. Could I get us to stand up and we'll pray together? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thanks, Father. Would you just all agree with me, those of you that have a liberty to pray out loud? Would you just, uh, God, we're just very grateful. We're so grateful for you. We bless your name, Jesus. We bless your name, Jesus. We lift up your name, Lord. Great big God, Lord, we just acknowledge you as the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the mighty God. Worthy, worthy. God, you are so worthy. You are so worthy. You are so worthy. Blessed be your name, Jesus. Blessed be your name. Don't be waiting for me to pray. You just get, This is something of Jesus in here right now. Just, just keep doing what we're doing, all right? Don't be looking for what happens next. Let's just, Father, we just say thank you so much, Lord. We're... We bless your name. We bless you, Jesus. We bless you. We bless you. We bless you, Lord. We bless you. We're so grateful. So grateful for life, Lord. So grateful for you. So grateful for friendships. So grateful for family, Lord. So grateful for health. Whatever health we have all walked in, each one of us as individuals walked in with, we're grateful for health. We bless you, Jesus. Thank you so much. Great big God, great big God, great big, magnificent, holy, righteous God, we bless you, Lord. We bless you, we bless you, we bless you, we bless you. So, Father, we pray that uh, the time we have together this morning, uh, we would sense, uh, we know your spirit's here, but I ask you to give us a sensitivity to your spirit in Jesus' name. Lord, we say, not only do we need you, Lord, but we really want you. Really want you, Lord. We really want you. We really want you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I want you. Lord, I want you. And Father, we, we, uh, we pray that as, as we would be sensitive to your spirit, you would do whatever work you want to do today in us, in me, Lord, Do what you want to do in me. Do what you want to do in each one of us, Lord, that we would be responsive to your spirit. I pray that we wouldn't be dull of hearing. I pray, Lord, that we would not be uh, uh, somehow not able to see or sense what it is that you're doing in us as individuals. God, we just just say we give you our, our minds, we give you our spirits, we give you our soul today, Lord, and say, God, have your way in us, in Jesus' name. And Father, I would ask in the name of Jesus today that, Lord, that there would be people that would be healed in the worship. I ask you in the name of Jesus, Lord, that there be people filled with your Holy Spirit. 
I ask you in the name of Jesus that the discouraged would be encouraged, that the depressed, Lord God, would find hope in you, would find joy in you in Jesus' name. Father, I pray that you'd chase mental illness as far from here right back to the pit of hell where it came from in Jesus' name. I ask you, Lord Jesus, that that no matter what kind of uh, emotional state we all walked in here in, Lord, I pray that you'd be the Lord even of of that in Jesus' name. And touch uh, people, Lord, this day as we worship together. In your name, thanks, Lord. Amen. Amen. Bless you, Luke. Mm. Oh, just said, welcome back to Street Invaders team. Good to have you guys with us. Would you welcome them? Be great.
Willingly we choose to surrender our life. Willingly our knees will bow. With all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we gladly choose you now.
day. Yes, we do. In your presence, all our fears washed away. Are, yes, they are. It's when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all. His love as loving as the where the prince by far its love get for us his precious blood. Cruz. 
Lord of vast and gracious time, race and love, my mighty river, poured in tears from above, heaven's peace and perfect justice is the It's 
Jesus, you are my help and my rest. You clothe your own in the joy and sing. Won't you come and cover me with the same? Wow. Thanks, Luke. There's a couple things um, before we let the children's go to children's church. The children's go to children's church. A um, couple things. One is uh, I was mentioning to Luke uh, before the service that what I've, we've talked about here that the Lord seems to be up to something and at least for a time uh, regarding our worship and the kind of the more minimal uh, style without having a full band. By the way, that's not because I'm in any way opposed to 
a full band. It just seems to be what the Lord is doing in the moment, and it it just feels right. And um, so I mentioned that to Luke. But what I want to say to to you as a congregation is part of why it's working is because you're responding. Like it's because you guys are like. Each week we've had different worship leaders. Now we get Luke back, uh, Jenny McGrew, who's been helping us, um, making sure that there were people to lead on a Sunday. She's trying to make it so that there's a selection, but that there's not too many, so we get to know some of the worship leaders a little bit, like Luke, second time here. Good to have you again. And hope there's another time. Yeah. And... um, at the same time, we could have great worship leaders, and if if there's no response from the congregation, especially when we're pared down, uh, it it'd fall flat. But you know, I listened to you this morning. You respond in the right places to respond, and there was an ebb and a flow in the worship, and and you responded to it. There were times, you know, when we did the shout to the Lord. Thing and every, the, it kind of crescendoed, crescendoed a little bit, and everybody participated, and it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Your worship is beautiful, and um, I'll tell you, I I am enjoying listening to the ebbs and the flows as the Spirit of Jesus just kind of moves us through things. So, um, could we put up the slides for the announcements? I'm going to give them this morning. I'll just do it rather than interrupt things here a little bit. So there, you see that? You're welcome. And then we have some announcements and some nice flowers. Yeah, lovely flowers. So you'll find these cards in, the, uh, uh, in, in front of you in the pew, pockets in the pew. And uh, if you need any, any kind of help, fill one of these cards out and get to our office. I need to let you know that Amar, I hear Amar, Amar, um, would you stand up? This lady is Amar, Krishnan, right? Did I say it right? Krishnan? Amar Krishnan. And Amar is in our office. Thanks, you can sit down. Uh, Amar is in our office, and um, she's kind of acting... Part, part administration, part my personal assistant. And it's such a delight working with you, Omar. It really is. Really good working with you. And you know what? Yeah, go ahead. Clap. You're allowed to you can do that. And I, I have uh, listened, not because I'm her boss. I just happen to listen. Um, as she calls people with these, when you fill out a card, it doesn't, it doesn't just go unnoticed, okay? And uh, she spends a part of her day making phone calls, which I really appreciate. If you get a phone call from me, you might want to cringe a little bit. Because it probably either means work or work. <laughs> but when you get a call from Amar, she's probably like, oh, how are you today? Well, I'll ask you that, too, because if you tell me you're sick, I can't get you to work. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, just kidding. So, next one. And we all, oh, no, we also have, um, we, also, with, uh, we have a welcome card that's also in the back of the seat. If you're here and it's your first time visit, would you fill out one of those cards? I'd be glad to have a record of your visit. I want to say welcome to those of you that are visiting today. It's uh, we're, glad to ha- we're glad to have you as our guests, and we trust Jesus talks to you today in our service. So, yeah, and then uh, here we go. Uh, Jenny McGrew wants to find out who all the worship leaders, musicians are, and if you email that, num- that email address right there, uh, that will- we will put you in touch with Jenny and... Uh, she's right now assessing what we have for resources and talent within our midst. Next one. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Every Friday night, 7 to 9 p.m., meet at the church gym, youth ministry. Got it, guys? That's for anybody that's under 85. 
No, just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, we came here one Sunday, the first Sunday we came in January, and I said to Linda, I said, I think we're the youth group. <laughs> at, least, <laughs> at least that's looking a little different now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, oh, man, that demographic, we've got to work on that. So youth ministry on Friday nights. Okay, great. And this is what we, we were letting you know about street invaders. Could you be praying this week? Um, this, last week was training for leaders and the teams. This week, they're on mission. They're going to be out. There's somebody on Salt Spring Island, correct? There's somebody with Sunrise. There's a team with Sunrise Church, and there's a team here. And Hastings. And Hastings, right. You're, you're working with uh, Chris Boyko on Hastings, correct? Is that who you're working with on Hastings? Wonderful. Chris Boyko is my personal trainer. Just saying, I have a different relationship with him than you guys do. He's mean to me. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, would you be praying for these teams that are out this week? Uh, th th there would be a lot of fruit. I've watched these young people. They're bold. They're really bold. They're bolder than most of us. Way bolder. And don't tell me it's because they're youthful. They're bold. You say, well, you see, if they weren't, bold, if you guys weren't bold, you know, we'd say, oh, well, it's because of peer pressure. You know, I say, we'll wait till you grow up. But when you are bold, then everybody goes, oh, yeah, it's because they're young. Yeah. Right? Like, can it? Like, but they're really bold. We could actually have some of that rub off. I could have, maybe I shouldn't say we, maybe you're all bold. Maybe I'm the only one that needs some of that to rub off on me. So be praying for them that there's lots of fruit this week, okay? And, and that everybody be safe. Working streets and stuff and traffic and yada yada. They just said, everybody be safe. Okay? Great. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Neil. Great. And our giving. All kinds of ways to give. You can see them there. Give. The operative word is give. There are all kinds of ways to give, except, you know, the one that we haven't reenacted yet or brought back yet is the passing of the plate. I say that's for tippers. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> See, so we can get into all kinds of discussion about giving and what it should look like. I'll tell you what, if you're a member in the kingdom of God, you ought to be generous. And I have never found generosity ever, ever, ever to work against me, ever. And I could tell you about all kinds of big stories where I went, yeah, Lord, really, you want us to do that? I gave away a Harley once. I did have a, seriously? That's my bike. <laughs> like, take my wallet, but leave me with the Harley for crying out loud. I have never yet, ever, given. Neither, Linda would say the same. I don't even like the word give, because to me, it, I know it's the right word, but I, I, I like the word invest. Because I invest in the kingdom of God. When I gave the bike away, I'm investing. You say, well, you got a calculator out looking for a return? No, I just know. Jesus' promise is, if you give, it'll be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, running out all over. That's a, that's a promise. And there's a promise. There's, a, there's nothing you're going to give that you won't get 30, 60, and 100 fold return on, both in this lifetime and in the one to come. And so I call you all to generosity. And thank you so much for your generosity up till now. And I just want to give you a little nugget that says, that's, okay, I was getting kind of weary with that. Just, you can't, you cannot be too generous with God. Not possible. Okay, great. Super. We done? We done all announcements. I think that's it. Oh, yeah, I'm Ken Parker. If you have. <laughs> so the children can go to Children's Church. Children's ministry, where you go, guys, all those that are from little to older, if you're 85 and under, no, no, sorry, I need a handful in here. So I think, what, what grade is it to? I keep forgetting. How, how old? Grade six. S say it again. Grade six. Grade six. Perfect. Where you go. 
Bless you. You know, this morning, um, I have one desire. We're going to have communion this morning. I have, I have one desire this morning, and that is that I would elevate Jesus. I want to, I want to talk, actually, I'm going to probably do two or three messages on seeing Jesus. I just want to elevate Jesus. Last week, I've been doing this series on grace, and then last week, I deviated just a bit because I, I was saying this to um, Dave Cox, and you'll be hearing and, and seeing more of Dave in, in days to come. But him and I were at coffee this week, and, and I said, you know, I'm doing this thing on grace, but I felt like before God, like, um, like you know, we could talk about grace and miss out the fact that the only way grace is realized in our lives is when we're walking with Jesus. That's the only way it's realized. So last week I talked about, you know, if, if, where Jesus said, if anyone serves me, let them also follow me. And talked about, you know, following being literally like to be in step with, to be in union with, to take on the same likeness as, all kinds of things like that. That, that when we're in step with Jesus, if we're, if, if we're uh, following him, he promises in that same breath virtually that he says this. He says, if, if you're following me, then you'll be where I am. That's brilliant. It took the infinite wisdom of God himself to say, if you follow me, then you'll be where I am. That's the idea. And, we, and because you're looking at me and where I am, then the fruit of your work is going to be blessed, and my Father will honor that because you're doing what I'm doing. Jesus modeled the same thing. He said, I only, I only do what I see my Father doing. I only say what I hear my Father saying. And my, judgments is ju my judgment is just because I only judge as I hear my Father judging. It's about Jesus, you guys. You know, you, the more you get to know me, and more you know I absolutely detest religious stuff. I, I just, like a lot of our Christian culture, you see me pushing back on it, and some of you go, oh man, that's kind of painful. Like, I, I like that. Yeah, but you see, but to me, if we're really, if Jesus is front and center, there ought to become an authenticity about us as individuals and about us as a church that has nothing to do with all the cultural baggage that comes with it. Now, I don't mind some of the cultural baggage at times. I can endure it. However, when it, when it becomes cheesy, when it becomes surface, when it becomes just fill in words, or it detracts from seeing Jesus, then I actually start pushing back. It drives me nuts. And uh, so, yeah, just threw that in. So I want to lift up Jesus today. I, I just want to talk about him a little bit. So I'd like you to turn with me in your Bible. Would you turn to Daniel chapter 7? And I'm not going to... There's a vision that Daniel's having here, and I don't want us to get into... Here's the thing about... A lot of things, especially when it involves Jesus, we, we forget it's about Jesus. I'm going to show you that two or three times this morning in the scripture. We forget about Jesus and we get all caught up like Daniel's vision. Now, what's his vision about? Well, forget about the vision. Let's see if we can find Jesus in this. Just for a sec, okay? So here's Daniel chapter 7. I'm not even going to read the bodies of, the, of scripture, but we're going to cover quite a bit of quite a few verses. I want you to look in verse 2, Daniel 7 and verse 2. In my night, in my vision that night, I, Daniel, saw. Did you see that? I saw. Now, verse 4, and as I watched, is part way through that verse, as I watched. And then if you look at verse 5, he says, then I saw. Now skip down to verse 7. And then in my vision that night, I saw once again. And then verse 8, as I was looking. And then in verse 9, I watched. And then in verse 11, I continued to watch. 
And then further on in that verse, I kept watching. And then in verse 13, and as my vision continued that night, I saw someone like, here we go. He looked long enough. He watched. He kept on watching. He looked. You know what happened to most of us? I, I work with prophetic people and I, I do, you know, teach on the prophetic and I mentor people in the prophetic. And you know what? The early tendencies when somebody's, you know, first experiencing prophetic stuff happening and until there's a level of maturity, you know what happens? We get fixated with the vision and miss the message. Well, I had a vision. We well, yeah, well, any donkey can prophesy. And if I knew you better, I wouldn't have said donkey. I would have used King James English. But then you would have been upset with me. <laughs> we, I got you on that one, bud. <laughs> so, he says, as my vision, I'm in verse 13... As my vision continued that night, I saw someone like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven, and he approached the ancient one and was led into his presence. And he was given authority, honor, who? This is the one that came into the presence of the ancient one. He was given authority, honor, and sovereignty over all the nations of the world so that people of every race and nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. He's looking at Jesus. You see that? All kinds of stuff he saw in the previous verses. The reason why I didn't read them is because you start trying to figure out what each part of whatever it was he was seeing was. But see, the bottom line is he saw Jesus. I get people coming to me all the time. They, honestly, I, I'm not exaggerating when I say this. And, and they want to share their vision or their dream with me, and I don't mind that happening. But I can tell many times it's about, aren't you impressed with the vision? And I'm looking like, so tell me where Jesus is in that. Like, where's Jesus in that? And I'm not challenging them. I'm interested. Like, where's Jesus? It was, oh, so yes, had a vision. Who? that's great. Where's Jesus in that? I say, oh, well, well, my dream was really elaborate. And it was all, my vision was whatever. Where's Jesus in it? Where do we glorify Jesus? Well, you know, I really know my Bible. I know it in, yeah, but where's Jesus in it? Well, I really know how to live the Christian life. Well, where's Jesus in it? Because it's Jesus who saves. It's Jesus who redeems. It's Jesus who pours his love out on us. It's Jesus who lavishes his Holy Spirit on us. It's Jesus. It's Jesus that does that. It's not our wisdom. It's not our visions. It's not our revelations. It's Jesus that does that. On a part... Uh, completely separate from me. It's got nothing to do with my works and what I've done. It's Jesus that does that. Somebody say amen, please, or I'm going to do an altar call and expect you all to get saved. <laughs> like it's Jesus that does that. It's Jesus who redeemed me. Man, I was... Today, people have been asking how I'm doing. If you really want to know the truth, I'm emotionally and physically spent today. Because um, yes, day before yesterday, on Friday, Linda and I went over to the island. And yesterday, <coughs> sorry, we participated in, I preached my dear, one of my dearest friends' celebration of life. And uh, we got on a ferry last night and booted it back so we could be here today. And you know when I, I'm reflecting on my friend's life and I'm listening to the people talk about him. He's a, he's a rare man. I actually preached uh, from uh, using Caleb as an illustration because believe it or not, my friend, our friend, Linda's as well, our friend actually modeled the life of Caleb. He, he was of that kind of quality. He was, he was a man who fully served the Lord. He was a man of a different spirit. 
And um, you know what? So we could have gone on and on about all of who he was. But you know, all through that two and a half hour meeting, it was all about he showed me Jesus. He led me to Jesus. Business people that he was working with, because he was a businessman, he was into several businesses. Business people that didn't know Jesus are standing on the platform. So he was persistent like a drip, 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 drip. And finally, after 11 years, I said, yes, Lord. And it changed my life. Because he lifted up my friend, our friend, Linda's and my friend, lifted up Jesus. Because it's just all about Jesus at the end of the day. It's Jesus. And he says, he goes on. Um, where am I here now? Daniel 7, verse 21 now. As I watched. And then I watched in verse 22 until. And then in verse 27. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be given to the holy people of the Most High in His kingdom, and it will last forever, and all the cities will see, will serve and obey. Sorry, does that say cities? All the rulers, sorry, will serve and obey Him. Ah, oh, it's just Jesus, guys. It's all about Jesus. There's another uh, uh, vision that I think we get sidetracked on. I'd like you to look with me at the book of Revelation. And there's a, often uh, we use Daniel and Revelation together to try to show what might be happening in the end times. And I don't know, man, some of you that have been you know, raised in the faith, I remember when I was in Bible school, they had what they called, uh, we had what they called Larkin's charts. And it was like, if, I could be exaggerating, but I don't think so. It was like, if you had a 12 by 12 room, those charts would go around the room twice. No, that is an exaggeration. But they were about eight feet long and about that high. And, and it listed what's going to go on, you know, what happened right from... Whenever to the end of time, and it was like all divided up and whatever. And I remember trying to, we get into these discussions and studies and whatever on the book of Revelation. And you know, it wasn't until about 15 years ago that I figured out that that was not what the book of Revelation was written for. Because if you look at the book of Revelation, and you look at what the vision was about, all you have to do is look at the title of it. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. And verse 1 says, this is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And somehow I missed it for decades, trying to figure out all the end time stuff in it. And I, I missed that, you know, at the end of the book, he, he, uh, John, the revelator, the one that had all this revelation of Jesus, at the end he says, um, blessed is the one who reads this book and understands it. And I remember beating my head against the wall. I've studied this like for, you know, 15 years, and, and I still don't understand it. It's because I was missing the point. It's not about, ultimately, uh, could it be saying some things about end times? Yeah, I suppose. But that's not what it's about. And I want to unpack that for you just a little bit for, in, a mo in, a, in a moment. But it was about the significance of the revelation that John was having of Jesus. It's, it's a revelation of Jesus. And people spend hundreds of hours trying to figure it out. But really what's going on, if you look, is in the time when John writes this, John is on the isle, island of Patmos. He's put there, it's a prisoner island, prison island. And he is isolated because of his faith and because he got in trouble, you know, for preaching his faith. And so he's put on, John's put on this, this island. And in the midst of that, he says in verse, uh, I don't know, I think it's about verse 3, he says, And I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And he was in the Spirit. And he said, and all of a sudden I, I began to see and God started, and the first thing he saw was Jesus, like he saw Jesus. And so this, all this vision comes to him, and, and, and God says, I want you to write to, Jesus says to him, I want you to write to the seven churches of Asia, 
And, and I want you to tell them about this. But here's what was going on. The, the churches in Asia at that time were facing ridiculous, severe, horrible persecution of that which not even our present world has known. I'm even talking about the former Soviet Union did not have the level of persecution like what was going on uh, for these uh, in Asia at the time of the Roman Emperor. At this time it was Domitian was the emperor. And he was really, really wicked. And, and the persecution was horribly severe. And the people were receiving their children on their doorstep dead. There were people being stripped naked and, lit, or, and rolled in, in tree pitch alive and lit up for, the Nero, or for uh, Domitian's courtyard uh, for the evening meals. Can you imagine? I mean, there's some kind of evil demonic thing going on with all that. And so... He, Here's John. Jesus is saying to John, look, I want you to write to the churches. And so he writes. But when he finishes it, he has to write in what we call apocryphal writings. It was the writings that were understood in that time, especially they were, they were um, mystical. The writings had significance, but you had to kind of know the language to understand what was going on. You say, well, why did he do that? Why didn't he? People say to me, so don't you take the book of Revelation literally? You can't. You can't. I'm telling you, you can't. Because it's, it's, not, lit, it's not written with literal language. It's written in apocryphal style which was the reason it was done like that was because the guards on the island are reading everything that goes off the island and can you imagine john saying to everybody uh, the churches i had a revelation of jesus and jesus says domitian is going down <laughs> wouldn't fly so what happens is he he writes in all of this um you know, metaphorical and mystical kind of language. But so the guards look at it and they say, well, John flipped his lid. He hasn't got a clue. Look, the guy's been on here too long. Somebody, like, put him out of his misery. So they let this off the island and it goes to the churches. And the churches read it and they're blessed in it. And whoever understands this at the end of the book, at the end of the is going to be blessed. Why? Because, guys, no matter what Domitian throws at us, here's the spiritual warfare that's going on. There is an enemy, and I'm telling you, that enemy's going to be chained, and he's going to be thrown into a bottomless pit, and I'm telling you, I'm telling you, at the end, Jesus wins. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. There will be no more crying. There will be no more sorrow. This is all about Jesus. Somebody be happy. You say, oh, I can read the book of Revelation now. Just don't try to figure out this horn and that horn. I'm not saying you shouldn't, maybe some other day. But if you want a revelation of Jesus, just, just read that there's a, Jesus shows up. What I find fascinating is if one of the first part, things that Jesus shows him, John says, and I saw Jesus standing and describes him, but one of my most favorite parts of it, and I saw in his right hand were the keys of hell and death. Domitian, take that in your face. Jesus defeated the devil. He not only defeated him, he literally stripped him of authority, stripped him of his possessions, stripped him, wiped him out. So much so that where the enemy, before Jesus died and rose again from the dead, the enemy had the keys of hell and death. But Jesus, in offering his life as a sinless life and as a sacrifice on the cross, in order for us to be redeemed, and he, he goes to hell. If you, you, if you know your Bible, you know he spent, there are three days that his body was in the tomb. He wasn't. You know where he was? He was in hell, setting captives free. And I'll tell you another thing he was doing in hell. When he was in hell, he looked at the devil, and he said, Devil, you tried to stop all this. Look, you, even, you thought killing me would end it, but here I am. Now give me the keys. 
because I, I have earned, I have bought back my possession. They were my possession. I'm talking about humanity. They were my possession. You stole them. You tricked them. You hoodwinked them. I paid the price to buy them back. That's called redemption. When you hear the word redemption, redeemed, that's what that is. He went, he bought us back, you guys, with his own life, his own blood, he bought us back. And he holds up the keys of hell and death. He said, boys, I not only bought you back, but I took the keys of hell and death. The devil can't even lock up his own stuff anymore. You know where that, you know the scripture says, and I think we're starting to get this. You, you, let me say this first before I go any further. You know, there are those who have a belief system that says that the, in the end times, everything's going to get worse and worse. There's this great falling away. Everybody's going to turn away. It's going to get so bad. Even, or even the elect would be deceived if it were possible. Even so, Lord Jesus, please come while we're hiding in the corner because this is getting really bad. I'm here to tell you. Jesus' kingdom never ends and it's ever growing. And I'm here to say to you that when Jesus says, and I give you the keys of the kingdom and whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed on earth. Or sorry, in heaven. I give you the keys of the kingdom. And he says, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We're supposed to be on the offensive, not the defensive. Oh God, thank you. That gate can't get me. Because I'm in the corner, and I know your grace covers, but oh God, please come before it gets any worse. The gate can't get me because you died for me. No, men and women of God, put on your war gear. Let's go storm the gates of hell because they cannot stand before the church. That's the message. And I'll tell you, the darker it gets around us, the more delight I take and go, light shines best in the darkest places. And if my worldview is, boys, I'll tell you what, we win. I read the book. I read Revelation. I'm blessed by it because I see Jesus in it. And we win. You win. You win. You win. I'm telling you, you win. You win. I'm saying it over and over. I just feel like I need to, I feel like I got a sledgehammer right now. And I'm busting down the Berlin Wall. Boom. You win. Boom. Did you hear me? You win. Oh, yeah, I see a little crumbling. No. Boom. You win. Boom. Somebody, before I have a heart attack, tell me, yes, we win. We do. We win, you guys. We really win. But it takes a revelation of Jesus to walk with that kind of sense of victory. Devil, you lose. I'm telling you, you, you lose, devil. <laughs> you not only lose, you lost. You're already done. So that's why the book of Revelation was written. And it's basically for two things. It, it reveals Jesus' character, his authority, his divinity, his majesty, and his supremacy to all of humanity. And secondly, it depicts in really graphic write, uh, writing the nature of the spiritual war that's presently going on. And ultimately, Jesus triumphs over every enemy, bringing his church, his bride, into victory with him. Man, I wouldn't want to be on any other team. <laughs> I don't want to be on any other side, man, because Jesus got this. Don't make the devil bigger than he is. I'm telling you, man, he's done. Live, you say, yeah, but I got pain in my life, man. If you knew it, you know, my friend died prematurely. And it's painful. <laughs> I don't understand it. He's younger than me. I thought he'd bury me. I told him what I wanted done with my ashes. Now they're telling me what he wants done with his. It's backwards. It's pain. I understand pain. 
But I still have to put a smile on my face because right now as I'm talking, I can hear Alex, uh, not literally, but I can, don't worry about it, bud, I'm fine. It's all good. Miss me, but uh, I'd be disappointed if you didn't miss me. But I'm good because I won. I knew I was going to win. I already knew that. How about you? We win. So that's what that's about. The second thing that the book of Revelation, oh, I already said that. I gave you both. So you can move along. You're taking too long anyway. Are you tracking with me? So, Revelation is especially clear in its presentation of the awesome resurrected Christ who has received all authority to judge the earth. Let me give you some examples. In the book of Revelation, he is called. In, John, in Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, he's called Jesus Christ. He's called the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth in verse 5 of chapter 1. In verse 17 of chapter 1, he's the first and the last. In verse 18, he is he who lives. He's the son of God in chapter 2, verse 18. He's holy and true in chapter 3, verse 7. He's the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God in chapter 3 and verse 14. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of, Je of David, sorry, in chapter 5, verse 5. He's a lamb in 5, verse 6. He's faithful and true in chapter 19, verse 11. He's the word of God in chapter 19, 13. He's the king of kings and lord of lords in chapter 19, 16. He's the alpha and the omega in in chapter 22, 13. He's the bright and morning star in chapter 22 and verse 16. And he's the Lord Jesus Christ in chapter 22, verse 21. Wow. Anybody? Wow. Man, I, I saw the horns, but I didn't see Jesus. <laughs> Look at that. Wow. The book really is a revelation of Jesus Christ since it comes from him. And it centers on him. It begins with a vision of his glory, his wisdom, and his power in chapter 1. And it portrays his authority over the entire church in chapters 2 and 3. He's the lamb who was slain and declared worthy to open the book of judgment in chapter 5. His righteous wrath is poured out upon the whole earth in chapter 6 to uh, chapter 18, and he returns in power to judge his enemies and to reign as the Lord over all in chapter 19 and 20, and he will rule forever over the heavenly kingdom in the presence of all who know him in chapter 21 and 22. I mean, this is Jesus. I think you're getting it. So I see a bunch of ways. See, when I started to twig onto this, and I'm going, okay, like, all right, so if it's about Jesus... So Jesus, like I started to research in depth and kind of go, all right, so Jesus, where do, show me all the ways that you show up in this. And I haven't, this is why I said I'm going to do this in series. I don't want to freak you all out with what I'm about to say because I'm not going to preach it all this morning, I promise. We're, we'll stop, I promise. But the, here's some of the ways that Jesus is revealed in the book of Revelation. He's, first of all, he's revealed in the Spirit. Secondly, he's revealed in the church. Thirdly, he's revealed in trials. Fourthly, he's revealed in spiritual warfare. He's also revealed to be in love with his bride, the church. And he's also revealed in the harvest, inviting everybody to come. That's all in that book. That's how he reveals himself. The first one is he's revealed in the Spirit. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10. Okay, now... Let me, let me see which one I'm going to pull this up on. I'm going to use this. So, oops, I don't want CIBC, I want my Bible. No, I don't want Air Canada, I want my Bible. <laughs> Please, not Air Canada today. If there's one area that I think Jesus so far has not won, it's Air Canada. I can't believe I just said that. So, Revelation chapter... 1 and verse 10. Lord, help me. You got it? So, 
That's good, because I haven't. Uh, what's that? Right here. This is it. I can't read one of those. I don't have good enough eyesight, hon. Uh-huh, sorry. <laughs> it's right here, and it's right here. Actually, I got it both places. I don't, want, I, want, I don't want to disturb that one. So, so here it is. Verse, uh, there it is. I, John, I'm reading from verse 9. With you all the way, with you all the way in the trial and in the kingdom and the passion of of patience in Jesus was on the island called Patmos because of God's word, the witness of Jesus. It was Sunday and I was in the spirit praying and I heard a loud voice behind me. I was in the spirit. By the way, guys, I'm trying to learn to live in the spirit, not just on a Sunday. And I think, honestly, I don't think, John, when he said I was in the spirit on Sunday, it wasn't because, well, this is, you know, because to him, actually, you know, I was, it was probably a Saturday. This is the message I was just reading from, and it was probably a Saturday. I was in the spirit on the Lord's Day because he was Jewish. And, and so, but, but I don't think he would, I, I think he could have said I was in the spirit on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. I was in the spirit. It's not unusual for me. I'm in the spirit. And I was in the spirit. Let me say this. Jesus wants us to learn to live in his spirit. For what purpose? To spin out with all kinds of revelations? No, to experience his presence in all of life's circumstances. You know, it's funny. Say, I need to get to church because I'm so worn out. This week was so hard. But you see, well, if I try, I'm learning. I am learning. I didn't say I've learned. I am learning to practice the presence of Jesus that even when I'm in a conversation with somebody and I'm joking, that, that somehow I'm listening to the Spirit. I have a really good friend of mine. His name's Mark Va. He's a missionary in Estonia. Some of you may know of him. Mark says of me, he says, you're the most unique guy I think I've ever met. And I said, why is that? He said, because I've never met anybody who can be telling a joke in one breath and start prophesying in the next. He said, just never. And, and I thought about it. I went, really? Doesn't everybody do that? And I thought about it. I said, you see, there's nothing in my life that should be unholy. It should all be holy. Hello? So in other words, Paul said, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, or you do it all in the name of Jesus. Do everything in the name of Jesus. So, you know, there's, there's certain, you know, um, things my body does that I'm not going to mention here. They say, well, did you do that in the name of Jesus? Yeah, actually. Yes. It's under the banner of whatever you do. doesn't matter what you do. Do it all in the name of Jesus. So, in other words, I should be, if I'm telling a joke, I should, be, I should still be aware and conscious of, well, God, you're in my life. Like, I can hear. I'm listening. That's being in the Spirit. And I'm trying to learn to live my life like that. Where, where it doesn't matter whether it's a joke. Because the reason Mark said that is because he watched that happen. If I would tell you where it was, we were in Estonia, and it was him and me, and a, and a third guy were in a sauna. You don't say sauna. It's sauna. And, you know, it, I'm telling you, with a, you, if you're visual, I was wearing a yellow raincoat because the reality is um, it, you, when you're in an actual, you know, uh, Estonian, Finn, whatever, sauna, you don't go in there with bathing suits. So we're sitting there, three guys, sweating, and I'm telling a joke. And I got finished the joke, we're all laughing, and then I look at this third guy, and I say, here's what the Spirit of the Lord says to you right now. And that's what Mark said after. He said, I've never met a guy like you, dude. Like, I, how do, because I don't care whether I'm in a sauna sweating. Like, do you think we could learn to live in the Spirit? Imagine if we come and show up here on Sunday morning for a celebration together, talking about, wow, this is what Jesus showed me this week. This is what happened. Do we need one another? Of course. But you know what? We should have our own walk with God. We really should. That's growing. You say, oh, I need to get into worship like what Luke led this morning. And let my heart, my soul will be refreshed. Yes, that's very true. Our mind was refreshed this morning. I just told you. But I just got back from my 
best friend, one of my best friends. So, I, of course, I, it washed over me. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. But it washed, his presence washed over me yesterday, too. When I walked into the building where we're doing the celebration of life, they had, Alex and I, we rode motorcycle a lot together. We did a lot of stuff together. But we, I walked in, and he, they had two of his motorcycles on display. And I thought I was going to hold it together until I saw those bikes. And then I lost it. It's like, come on, buddy. And they had his leather jacket and his helmet on the, on the one side. And I'm standing there and I'm going, Jesus, thank you for letting me know such a man as this. And I'm going, Lord, fill me. I, like right now, like I'm supposed to do the preach today and I, I don't even know if I, I don't even know if I want to go any further. I think I want to go back out to my car. But Jesus shows up because that's what Jesus does. I said this morning, oh, Linda, go preach for me. I'm staying home. Well, you laugh. She knew I was serious. She said, get your shoes on. <laughs> no, it wasn't because I was depressed, because I'm exhausted. And, but you know what? I've always found that in my weakness, he's made strong. And his grace is always sufficient. Because Jesus, Jesus, that's what he does. If we're having, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to reveal Jesus to us. And if we're having so-called spirit encounters and they don't ultimately reveal Jesus and glorify Jesus, then we need to question their origin. And what was my motive in giving it in the first place? Holy Spirit encounters will always reveal Jesus and glorify him. And if it doesn't, shut up. Sorry. That got quiet. You can't believe I said that. You know. You know what, I'm, with my wife, I'm better off saying to her, shut up, than I am saying, shh. You know, I don't do either, just so you know. <laughs> 46 years, I don't do, I haven't figured it out. But Linda, for some reason, it's really, to her, and it, it was obviously a trigger, it has something to do with as she was growing up or whatever, I never really asked her. But if I go, shh, that is really disrespectful. So I didn't want to say, shh, here right now, because shut up's less disrespectful. So, so, when the Spirit of Jesus intersects somebody's life, when the power and the presence of God engages with a person's spirit, there should be a result, there should be a difference, because it's an encounter with Jesus. And you can't encounter Jesus without some sort of Result, cause and effect, it just doesn't happen. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. In Revelation 19, verse 10, when the angel starts showing John some of this stuff, he says, I fell at the feet of that angel to worship him, but he said to me, see that you don't do that, because I am, a, I am your fellow servant, and you and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Come back to Jesus, everybody. Jesus said in John 15, 26, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. The Spirit testifies of Jesus. 16, John 16, 14 says, He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Wow. We must look and keep on looking for Jesus. To see him or hear what he is saying, the goal is not to have a vision or a spiritual encounter. The goal is to have the Lord reveal something of himself, of his character, of his ways, of his plans, of his will, or of his heart for us. That's the glory. You know, that's what the enemy tries to steal from us with, you know, feeling like, you see, when, it, when I use the term Christian culture, I've traveled enough and I've been in enough cultures and I've also traveled in Canada enough in enough churches and cross-denominationally 
to know that every church has its own culture. And every church has its unspoken rules and regulations. Nothing to do with the Bible. It's just what we do here. What we do here is what we do here is. But see, the, th the problem with what we do here is where it begins to make it a culture. The culture is it affects what, how we think. It affects how we process stuff. It affects uh, how we view somebody else. It just, culture, it makes it affect everything. The problem with it when it's not Jesus-centric, when it's not just all about Jesus, is that we begin when we've been baptized in the love of God, but now all of a sudden we want to be accepted by that group. And so in this group, well, no, you don't do that. Well, I wouldn't do that here, no, because I won't be accepted. And so what happens is we all get plastic. You know what I'm talking about? It's like brother-sister stuff. Here's two confessions. You guys have only been here for a month. You're going to hate me maybe about the time I'm done here. You see... You know, you may be my brother or my sister, and I have no problem with saying, uh, you'll hear me say, hey, brother, hey, brother. How? But I hate it when it's used as titles. Brother Luke, would you please come to the platform now? <laughs> and it's disrespectful if you don't call me Brother Ken or Pastor Ken. That's culture. Oh, boy, I'm stepping all over it in here. I can just tell. It's like, you see, what? and I don't, I don't um, slam those things trying to be rude. I, I find myself slamming them because I think they keep us from Jesus. I think they make us look for the horns instead of Jesus. Are we doing everything right? And it's like, am I being accepted here? Yes, you are. But that's not even important whether you are or not. What's important is Jesus accepts you. <laughs> he really loves you. I'm going to conclude. I could just go on forever and you're going good because we're going to have communion together. But I want to just tell you a little story of one of my own encounters with Jesus. And when we talk about making, being vulnerable, I'm going to make myself very vulnerable here because you don't know me that well yet. And so you're going to go, man, this guy's really flaky, man. He's really messed up. So 2000 and... 2006, I had open heart surgery, uh, quadruple bypass, and then over the next few months, they put another seven stents in my heart. Told me I can't work anymore. Said, yeah, my body creates plaque and under stress, and I can't work. Uh, at that time, we were facing, because we had just moved to Victoria, we were facing all kinds of financial stuff, all kinds of things were going on. It was just... It was just a, a time of massive upheaval, upheaval for us. And then on top of that, I get told this kind of stuff. And I, I was preaching couch and camp. I was doing the evening meeting. And Elsie Welch had come. She's one of my best friends. And she had come, those of you that know Elsie, I only mention her name because you've had her here a number of times. So Elsie had come over to the island just to support me because she knew I was going through just a really super rough go. So she was there to pray. So anyway... Um, part of the rough go for me, and I hadn't even talked to her about this, was that, you know, I had the enemy throwing everything at me. It was like, see, look, you've trusted God. Now you're going to end up broke. You, you don't even have a way to make an income. Look, and this is going to happen. Look, you're going to become the laughing stock. And look, I'm going to take this away from you, and I'm going to rob that from you, and I'm going to drag this out. And I, I started listening to it, and I was right under the weight of that. Don't look at me like that. Has anybody else ever gone there? So, I'm like, oh, here we go. I've got to find what I was looking for. Here we are. No. Here it is. So, I'm, I'm really under the weight of it. And I'm the evening guy. And believe it or not, I was preaching on a kingdom worldview of trials, of all things. And so it was probably about the third day in, and Elsie and I are sitting in the dining hall. They're using picnic tables. We're sitting on one side. The guy's talking. Like We had the morning, you know, teach adult session, and I was sitting there to listen to it. Elsie was sitting beside me, and we're listening to this guy talk. And 
without a word of a lie, all of a sudden, Jesus, in a vision, he walks through the dining room doors from outside, walks right over on the other side of the table from me, looks at me and says, come on, get up, I want, I want to show you something. Now, I don't know what happened, but Elsie saw it. In the spirit, my body's still there, in the spirit, I get up to start following Jesus. I told you I was making myself vulnerable. I get up to start following Jesus, and Elsie grabs me by the arm, and she says, you're having a vision, aren't you? I can tell you. And I'm sitting right there. It wasn't like I'm walking away from her. I'm, my body's there, and she grabs me. You're, you're having a vision, right? I can tell you're having a vision. What's going on? And I just, I looked at her. I said, Elsie, I said, uh, I'm not sure. I'll be back in a while. <laughs> so, so this was at the start of that meeting. So anyway, I walk out, and Jesus is from here to the wall in front of me, and he's got his back to me, and he's walking, expecting me to follow him. And as I'm following him, there are these boys, the demons, lying on both sides of the road on the way out of the camp, both sides of the road, and they're screaming all this stuff I was just talking about. And the voices are raging, like they're, they're really loud as I'm following him and all that stuff, saying all the kind of stuff I just said to you. So as I'm following Jesus, I noticed that the volume was going down and there weren't as many demons. And the further I followed Jesus, I felt like I was, the air started getting thick and I felt like I was, in a fog, but there was no fog, and I felt like maybe like it was a heavy for, uh, treed forest, but there were, weren't any trees there. But, but it just felt thick. And so as I'm walking, more and more, and I'm hearing demons now say, I can't go any far farther. I got to stop here. I can't keep going. I can't keep going. Until finally, there were no more demons. Jesus had stopped walking. I caught up to him, and I stood beside him. Now listen, even I was smart enough there. I kept my mouth shut because it was dead silence now. We're talking total silence. It was like the most peaceful thing. I, like all those, I didn't realize how those voices were affecting me. And, and, and all of a sudden, everything stopped. And there was this total peace and quiet. And I didn't want to do like Peter and make some stupid statement or something. So I just stood there. And we stood there for a long time. He wasn't saying anything. And then finally, after a long period of time, I looked at him. And I said, what is this place? Where, where are we? What are you showing me? And you know what he said to me? He said... This is what they call the secret place. This is, this is what they call the secret place. I'm like, wow. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures to you in a minute about the secret place. I didn't know them before. I didn't see them like I'm going to read them to you in a minute. But what I, what, uh, what I began, as I'm standing there in this quiet, when he said that to me, I still just continued to stand in the quiet. And then after a while, I said to him, Jesus, I don't, I don't want this to stop. And I said, I know what's going to happen. I said, what's going to happen is this vision is going to end, and I'm going to be right in the middle, back in the middle of the messiness of my life and everything that's going on. And I said, I just don't want this to stop. And he said to me, you can come back here anytime you want. I said, but Lord, I didn't see how you got here. I, like, I was just following your back. I, like, I, there were no GPSs then. It's like, like, God, like, I don't know how to get here. I, he said, you've been here, you can get here again. And I'm going to teach you how to show others how to get here. You know what I'm doing this morning? I'm teaching you how to get there. It's seeing Jesus. It's spending, you know, we could talk about, you know, praying and reading his word and all those. Those are all, that, that's all part of it. But it's putting, it's, so next thing you know, I end up, the vision ended. And I'm sitting beside Elsie again, and she looks at me and she goes, you're back. I don't have a clue what I look like. And as a, I, that made her even identify that. But then the guy who was talking just finished, and I, I said to Elsie, because I left when the guy started, or it just started. I said to Elsie, how long did he talk for? And she looked at her watch and said, 50 minutes. And that's the time. I, you guys, it changed my life forever. Jesus changed my life. 
And here's this. Later I went, what about this secret place? So here's the scriptures. And I'm just going to read the scriptures and I'm going to unpack them. Psalm 27, verse 5, New King James Version, Version says, For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. That also can be translated presence. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. And he shall set me high upon a rock. Now, how about this? For in the time of trouble, that starts out. Psalm 31, verse 20, in the New Living Translation says, You hide them in the shelter of your presence, safe from those who conspire against them. You shelter them in your presence, far from accusing tongues. I'm like, wow, I was there. Psalm 91, 1. He who dwells in the secret... Did you hear that? Dwells. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You see, counselors help, but Jesus is better. Coaching helps. But Jesus is better. And I'm not saying we should reject any of the rest of it. Please don't hear that. All I'm saying is at the end of the day, when we get our eyes on Jesus, everything starts to come into perspective. And so I invite you today to look and keep on looking. And look. And keep on watching. And look again. And keep on looking. We get to... We get to have communion this morning. It's because of the Lord's sacrifice in which we remember what he's done for us as we, as we have communion. It's because of his sacrifice that we can look and keep on looking and find him. Before I go any further, is there anybody here that you didn't get one of these when you came in? Anybody need to? Yeah, there's a few people. Put up your hand because we got... Some gentlemen coming around to make sure you get one. Yeah, just hang on. We'll make sure we get everybody. Oh, way up. There's people up in the balcony as well. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. There. Okay. So one of the ushers will come up and help you there. Up in the balcony too. So. This is Communion. Wow. To me, communion is what well, Jesus said, do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. This, this brings us back right to the foundation of our faith that Jesus lived a sinless life. He died. He shed his blood for us, rose again from the dead, ascended to the Father so that in him we might have life. Isn't that great? In him we might have life. Wow. But it's even more than that. I really believe that communion is, is what should happen for, for us to be bound together and us to get it. You know what? We are brothers and sisters, but by one common blood. Right here. You're my brother from another... Well, no, it doesn't work. <laughs> I caught it. <laughs> I was going to say it to you, Luke. That wouldn't be good at all. I guess it. But we're, if you know Jesus, you're my sister. You're my brother. And when you tick me off, or I tick you off, I need to remember that you and I are in the same family. And it's because of Jesus. It's all because of Jesus. We're in a world that needs Jesus. If ever there was a world that needed Jesus, the world needs Jesus now. But it's going to take people who have met with Jesus, not just 40 years ago, not even just last week, but continually meeting with Jesus in order to bring something of life 
to a lost and dying world. This communion helps us remember that. Would you stand with me? Are you seeing Jesus? Are you sensing Jesus for you, not just corporately? This is your moment. This is a moment for healing. Physical healing, mental healing, Emotional, spiritual. This is a moment for healing. As we take this communion together, would you hear Jesus speak into your pain? Would you hear him speak into your celebrations, into your victories? Hear him speak into your questions. Holy Spirit, would you guide us through this most sacred of experiences as we share together in communion? Lord, I confess to you that in this area of communion, it's been so easy for me to get religious and miss you. Just lead a communion. Jesus, I pray today that for me and every person here, this would not be about whether we do it all right. This would be about what you said. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Thank you for the gift of communion, of your table, that brings us back to remembering you. So we remember you today. And we ask you to bless this wafer and this juice as it would represent your body and your blood, represent the sacrifice that you made for us. We ask you to bless these, Lord. We set them apart to represent your body and your blood. Thank you so much for giving your body. Thank you so much for shedding your blood. I need to say, if there's anybody here today and you don't know Jesus, you've never accepted him, if you share together in this communion, you are making a profession of faith. You are saying, I am going to trust Jesus. I would suggest to you that if you're not quite there yet, maybe you don't, because I tell you what, this is about, and I invite you to, even though maybe you've never accepted the Lord before, but I invite you to share with us in communion. If you're in a place in your heart where you're saying, Lord, I want you to have my life, and I'm so grateful for what you've done for me, we invite you. So together... Lord, we say thanks for the bread. Let's share together. Hmm. Thanks for your body, Lord, that was broken. I can't tell you how much I am longing to hear 
the testimonies, re I'm talking about now testimonies, not a year ago or five years ago, but right now, today testimonies of people being healed as we stand in the presence of God. I am longing for that. Would you long for it with me? There's people here today that are sick. And I just know because of the sacrifice of Jesus, as we, I just know God wants, he wants to touch your body. He wants to touch my body. Let's let our faith rise for that. And God, may be, this be the day. I speak healing to you. And I say, Lord, let this be the day that we have a today story of your healing. I say be healed in Jesus' name. I don't say that of my own man's thing. It's because of what Jesus did. His body was broken for us. His blood was shed for us. Let's share together in the in the juice. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. Be filled with the Holy Spirit today, church. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with Jesus today. I say to you, the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. May you just have an awesome week with Jesus being revealed to you. I end this now, and I invite you to take some time to greet one another as we've had communion together. Would you greet one another? Would you welcome one another? Would you look for an opportunity even to pray for somebody? Let's just take some time. As we, as we end, as we conclude. God bless you guys. Have an awesome week. Mm.